2008. We're at the home of Mr. William Bill Cameron at his home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Bill, and thanks for participating in today's project. Welcome to the house, Brad. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. I was born in Denver, Colorado on August the 8th, 1921. And I've lived, during my childhood, I lived in Colorado, in Craig, Colorado. I went to grade school and high school in Craig. And when I graduated from, from uh, high school, I and another fellow caught a train on the, a freight train on the Moffat Railroad and went to Denver. And then soon after that, my folks lived, moved to Denver. And it wasn't too long after that. This was in 39. So it was only a few years until the war started. And when the war came along, I, my brother, my older brother, was already in the Army. In fact, he was at Schofield Barracks in, in uh, Hawaii when the Japanese hit that area. So I decided I should join too. But I, uh, it wasn't only my brother. I felt it was sort of a duty, young and healthy and able to do it. So in February of 1942, I went down to join the Air Force. I was going to be a pilot. But I couldn't pass the eye test. At that time, you had to have 20-20 vision to be a pilot. So I went next door and joined the Army. And I, I my first reported was to Fort Logan. That was a reception station at that time. And there I took a battery of tests for them to determine where I should be assigned and what training I got and so forth. And they decided I should go to the field artillery and sent me to a training camp in California. It was Camp Roberts, California. That was about halfway between L.A. and uh, San Francisco. Now, did you, uh, when you enlisted, did you, did you enlist with any friends or did you enlist alone or? No, I enlisted by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I was 20 years old at the time and my parents had to approve my enlistment because majority age at that time was 21. But they sort of reluctantly did it. I talked them into signing for me. But then after I got to Camp Roberts, I was uh, uh, in basic training or raw recruit for a while. But I stayed at Camp Roberts until I finished individual training where you specialized in a certain area and so forth and then was reassigned to the 3rd Observation Battalion in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And while uh, I was at Fort Sill, I learned about the Officers' Candidate School. I decided, oh, I'm going to apply for the Officers' Candidates. And lo and behold, I was accepted. <laughs> so I completed officer school and graduated and was awarded a commission second lieutenant. You didn't need a college education at that time to be an officer or was that a requ that wasn't a requirement? Uh, a, a college education? No, okay. No, it was not. If you just uh, you went before a board of officers and they interviewed you and they could approve you or disapprove you. But uh, that's all it took and they approved me going to OCS. So I completed OCS in 
March of 43. And uh, while I was at OCS, <coughs> pardon me, uh, I met a young fellow, Walter Clary, from Syracuse, New York. And he and I decided we were going to join the paratroops. <laughs> so our first assignment, and we were assigned together to Fort Clay, Kentucky, which was a training center for the infantry. While we were there, and we sort of conditioned ourselves. We let the troops go for a march, let the NCOs take them. And then we'd run to catch up, but we were getting in shape for jump school. So we knew we would be going to jump school. We'd applied for it. So my next assignment was at jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia. And that lasted a month. Actually, we had a, officers had an extra week because of the jump master training, and we made a night jump that the troops didn't have to make. And that was an, quite an experience in itself. The, the, the jump school is in four phases. The first phase is all physical training, running and exercise, and that's all you do. And the next week you start l learning a little bit of the techniques of jumping. They have a landing trainer where you slide down the, rails and hit the ground, that kind of stuff, jump off of a platform and tumble, and mock playing on the ground there where you jump out of the door and learn how your body position should be and so forth. And <clears throat> then the next stage was C stage where you did all these things plus we also then went up on the what we called the buddy seat. It was just a seat that raised you up to the top of a 250 foot tower. Well, we were the last class to use the buddy seat because the, the thing broke and a person was killed on it so they <coughs> cut it out. But then also we had the 250 foot towers where the parachutes are rigged on a ring and then you are lifted up to the top and the instructor is down below and we have bits of paper he says release your paper the reason for that is to see if the wind will blow you into the tower but it really didn't make too much difference because you release the paper and you see the way, uh oh, it's going towards the tower. Instructor would say, well, you have slipped to the right, <laughs> slipped from the tower. Then he'd say, re there was four chutes on each tower and he'd say, release number one, number two, whatever. So we went through that. And then the next phase was packing your parachute. We learned to pack our parachute in the landing stage, and we made our first jump. And that was the D stage. And you make five jumps and qualified parachutists, and you get wings like that over there. And if you stay in the paratroopers for a little while, get a certain number of jumps. You become a senior parachutist and you get a star on your wing. Then the other criteria, you get to be a master jumper and you get the star and a wreath over. I was, was in it long enough that I was a, became a master parachutist. But after jump school, I was assigned to a unit at Camp McCall. North Carolina, and while I was there, uh, my wife, that's her picture over there, 
was uh, here in Denver, and we were wanting to get married and so forth before I went overseas. So she came down to North Carolina and we got married in the, there. And there actually, uh, the unit I was in at Camp McCall got transferred to Fort Bragg and we got married in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And soon after that, I wanted to go overseas. I got orders to go overseas to the 82nd Airborne Division. This was in May of 1944. So then after that, I guess you probably know a lot of the... <laughs> but in June the 6th on D-Day, well, let's stop. Let me back up. There's a, a number of questions I wanted to ask you, okay. uh, and then and then we'll we'll start with uh, with that event. Uh huh. Uh, how did you come to choose the, uh, uh, jump school? I mean, what? In parachutes. Oh, I, it was just a challenge, and it uh, something I thought I'd like to do. H had you ever been up in an airplane before? Uh, well, I think maybe a little cub or something in Craig on one of these, uh -huh. but really not much. But, and and uh, from what I've, I've talked to other people uh, in previous interviews and from what I read, that was a, a fairly hard uh, unit to get into. You, uh, It was a highly, highly selected uh, group of people. Well, um, of course, it was during the war, and I guess they were... But in jump school, oh, I'd say a third of the class anyway washed out right. before they got through the jump school. If you went on a run in jump school, if you fell and you couldn't help yourself, you just mm -hmm. fell and got run over, they'd keep you in. But if you just quit and ran to the side, they'd wash you out. <laughs> and it was it was tough. The A stage was pretty tough. Yeah. I remember one time we were exercising with Indian clubs and uh, President Roosevelt came by to see it. And we didn't see him because we were facing the other way, but he drove behind us. And little Sergeant Fiorita, he was my buddy. He'd come up and let me rest my arm on his shoulder. <laughs> uh. The poor Sergeant Fiorita was killed later on in a plane crash there at Fort Benning. But uh, managed to get through jump school. Do you remember your first jump? Can you still remember that first, very first jump? Well, your f first jump... Uh, you're not particularly scared. You're really, yeah. a bit apprehensive of what's happening, but you're thinking more about, now what do I do? What's next? And so forth. So then when you jump and you get that opening shock, that's great. You look up there and see the canopy. Then what you, when you hit the ground, that's really a time to celebrate. You made it safe. <laughs> But I was very fortunate. I, it, our shoots at that time weren't like the shoots they have nowadays. Most of the time you were oscillating, swinging back and forth. I know Lieutenant Servic, Servic, he was a kid from Minnesota, a big Swede kid, and he always used to say, when you hit the ground, I bounce. <laughs> It was, uh, but anyway, I guess should we return to? Well, uh, I'll just uh, just a few more questions, and then we'll get. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit about from Fort Bragg. Where did where did you uh, embark from from the states to go overseas? Uh, uh, embarked from uh, New York. New York on a ship. Any time it was all ships. Can you tell me a little bit about that crossing? Because I've heard all sorts of stories about. Uh, the, the Atlantic crossings, and what what was that like for you? Uh, nothing really. 
eventful happened that I hardly remember the crossing. Is that Kenneth right? Bradley. Even as a, a, a from a landlocked state, uh, you had no problem getting your sea legs, or no? Is that right? No, I, I didn't get seasick or anything. Uh, and you landed in in England then? Yes. Okay. Forget. Uh, I think it's uh, Northampton or something. I'm not sure. And then, and then the unit, the 82nd, uh, I was assigned to the 456th Parachute Field Artillery Battalion, which was the original parachute battalion of the field artillery. It was the original field artillery battalion. I can't say it right. Original parachute field artillery battalion. And uh, so then, this was in May, and it wasn't too much longer until D-Day came along. Were, were they giving you any idea of what you were going to be doing? I mean, until you boarded the planes that night, did you have any idea what was happening? Or Yes, we were all isolated to airfields. The 82nd took off from seven airfields in the area and they rendezvoused and before the flight to France. And during that time, uh, the officers were briefed on what the mission would be and so on and so forth. And uh, the NCOs, key key people were briefed, but uh, at this time we were all restricted to the airfield for about 48 hours. And then, uh, I, if I recall correctly now, uh, we were, the mission was on at one time, and then it was canceled, and then it was uh, on again when we went. And this was, I think we took off about 11.30 at night or something like that. But we jumped around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning on, uh, our objective was St. Mary Galice, which we captured within few hours. Even captured it before they hit the beaches. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Were you, uh, so you weren't one of the, it seems like a lot of the parachutists and, and planes were off course and a lot of didn't make their initial landings. Were you able to land where? Yes, we were very close to our objective. Now the, the 101st Airborne, they were real scattered. They okay, maybe that's what I'm time. thinking of. That was probably stories about the 101st. They had it. But the 82nd, our pilots did a good job. But our, or maybe our pathfinders, you have pathfinders that go in first, day or two ahead of time, and set up mm -hmm. communications and ways that they can direct the aircraft. There was a lot of flak, but. It seemed like the flak was all below us. I guess the guns couldn't shoot up to the altitude we were flying or something. I don't think we lost any airplanes from flak or anything. Don't worry. But uh, what what were you thinking as, as you were flying over? I mean, how did for a person like myself who's never been in battle? How do you prepare yourself? To go into battle, uh, did what? Any ideas? Any thoughts there? What you were thinking as you before you jumped on the flight over, and and then as as you were jumping, I guess. Well, you tried, of course, to focus on mission, what you were doing, and what the best course of action would be if you were in a pickle. But uh, again, you were pretty focused on that, 
trying not to think about bad things, you know, and thinking about, oh, I'll do this and that, and so forth. Got to establish communications, got to get things going, and so on, this yeah. kind of thing. You had a lot of responsibility, not just for yourself, but uh, your men, yeah. and, yes, okay. As a jump master, you had to, but also, uh, now our unit didn't all go into Normandy. The only part of the unit that went into Normandy was two gun sections and the forward observers and liaison officers with the infantry. But the bulk of our unit came by boat. Oh, is that right? Uh, yeah, the next day. Then after us, there was artillery that came in in gliders. gliders. They were uh, 329th, I think, I don't recall the number of the glider battalion, but uh, they landed soon after that, and of course there was uh, artillery units from other divisions and so forth that we could call on. Now our artillery, we only had two guns and we didn't have any luck with them because we never never could put them together. What was that right? You dropped them in eight loads from the belly of the plane and two loads from the door and uh, you lose a apart and you're out of business. Mm -hmm. So I just mainly uh, was sort of just of a third thumb going along with the infantry, you know, till things got the next day and they got things more organized. We got communications and our own artillery. But we were there in France for 33 days without replacement at all. But our objective, in addition to securing St. Mary Galice, the higher headquarters anyway, hoped that we would draw some of the troops from the coast, from the German troops from the coast and so forth. And I don't think that happened. No. But we did prevent any troops from going to the coast, you know, to mm -hmm. help the Germans that are on the beach and so forth. We did do that. And like I say, we captured St. Mary Galice in short order. And the people uh, are very grateful for that, but then they were sort of sorry because after we captured St. Beard Police, the Germans started shelling it and they had a lot of civilian casualties. In it. But uh, then after Normandy, or after, well, yeah, the French. Uh, Normandy, we returned to England and... Uh, After that 33 days? Yeah. Uh -huh. Turned to England, we got several missions. I think they said we got 18 missions. But before they were supposed to happen, the Supreme Headquarters, Allied Supreme Headquarters in England, would finally get the word that General Patton had already reached him. <laughs> he was moving like mad. Yeah. Higher headquarters couldn't even keep up. So our next operation was Operation Market Harbor, which was the jump into Holland. And that was a, a daytime jump. And it was pretty, But we still got some people scattered across the Rhine there in the Wall River. Where our objective was Graves, and then our 
major mission was to secure the bridge at Nijmegen, Holland, and what 505 and 504 did. But the operation sort of failed because uh, the primary mission or objective of the operation was to provide a way for British armored troops to come up into Holland and they were supposed to join. They had a paratroop regiment that jumped on uh, Arnheim, but uh, unfortunately they got annihilated at Arnheim and up there and the British uh, armored division or whatever it was, for some reason didn't have enough gas, they ran out of gas or something. <laughs> anyway, the 101st was jumping south of us and we were up there at Nijmegen, north of there to form this corridor for the British to come, but the British wasn't able to make it. So after the Holland operation, we went to Camp Reims in France, and the 101st went to Camp Sweeps, I think it was. General Taylor was the commander of the 101st, General Slim Gavin, who was a great commander, was our commander. He was the youngest major general in the army. He got promoted. He started out in Sicily as a colonel, as a regimental commander, and then he got assistant division commander, and then was a division commander when they went into Normandy. And let's see. So after uh, we were, while we were there at Reims, we got the word uh, General Ridgeway had become airborne commander in England then, and he called the 101st, asked them how soon they could get out. This is when the Germans started invading through Belgium, we called the Bulge, mm -hmm. and uh, General uh, Taylor was on emergency leave or something in the States, and General McAuliffe was the acting division. You've heard of Nuts McAuliffe, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, General McAuliffe said, take 24 hours. Gavin says, oh, we can get out in 24. So we were given the mission of protecting Liege, which is north of Bastogne. It's a big supply point there, and they wanted to make sure the Germans didn't get there. And we went through Bastogne up to Liege, and the 101st went to Bastogne. So it could have just been the other oh, way boy. around. Uh, but anyway, they had a tough time there. But the, uh, there during the bulge, the 82nd Airborne was sort of on a bulge out to the front, and the units up alongside of us couldn't uh, straighten out the line. So they pulled the 82nd back, and that was the only retrograde movement we ever made. Every time we, any other time we never gave up a foot of ground. <laughs> but I was a forward observer during this period, and I was out in front of the of trapones, and our troops were in trapones, and our communications broke down. And I didn't get the word that people had left. So on Christmas Eve, well, earlier Christmas night, we had heard a little noise up there and sent one of the men up there. It was only me and three enlisted men, a sergeant and 
communications man and jeep driver. We were up there observing artillery fire and directing artillery fire from that position. But anyway, we heard a little noise and they went up there and, and it turned out to be a patrol from the 504 parachute to infantry battalion. So uh, we didn't think nothing of it. And later on, all of a sudden, we got small arms fire in our position and uh, command handy ho, the Germans were there. Turned out there was German, uh, I don't know if it was patrol or just what it was, but there were 65 of them, a little more than we could compete with. So we did handy ho and surrender. They shot two of my men, one in the wrist and one in the leg. I mean, uh, Sergeant Burton and I were not touched. We were out. Mm. They beat on us a little bit, but that, you know, trying to get us to tell them things. But uh, there wasn't much of that because they were trying to get back to their own lines and they weren't sure how to do it. And they were more interested in that than they were us. But they put us in the middle of the column. They were marching in single file. And uh, I we worked our way to the back of the column. I would step out of line <laughs> until someone would come along and whack us with a rifle and knock us back into line. But we kept doing that and working our way towards the back of the line. And we did that. And Atkins, who was my radio operator, was the man that was shot in the wrist. And uh, Ebling was shot in the leg, and the Germans just left him. They didn't even try to take him or anything. They just left him. And fortunately, he got back to the Jeep and drove back into a German house there and got evacuated to our hmm. forces and so forth. But that was... but. Uh, Atkins didn't. I decided that uh, you know we'd come up with this plan to escape. That uh, I would act like I had my leg caught in a limb or something, you know, and form a gap. And we have to run the gap. Now I did that, not on purpose, but I saw we were forming this gap. So, uh, Sergeant Burton, I said, we're taking off. I, said, and I took my belt off and gave him one end of it and I held the other. So I did this little trick and we formed the gap. We took off like we were running to catch up, but we took off. And that's how we escaped. Is that? <laughs> so we got back to our unit. And... Uh, When we were on our way back to our unit, here was our jeep sitting in front of a house there. And we, that's how we found out that Evelyn had been back there. The Germans had told us Evelyn had been back there and he, uh, they arranged for our forces to get him back to a hospital and so forth. So we all come out of it, luckily, very... Uh, Sergeant Burton and I, of course, came out the best. We never got scratched. A few breezes from being pummeled by the Germans. With a big OSS trooper that spoke perfect English, you know. Didn't give him the right answer, he'd hit you a little bit. But. Uh, well, one little German Wehrmacht, he was uh, 
in the German army, part of the patrol, kept putting a gun in my stomach and asking me to tell him where the German troops were. I told him, well, they're in trade homes, trade homes. But I guess he didn't believe it, and I'm glad he didn't, because actually they were. But that's where the 505 was. I was trying to lead them down there, but it didn't happen. <laughs> but anyway, the German leading this group finally went to a house there and got a rancher or a Belgian to lead them where they wanted to go. Hmm. All this time, I mean, this is during, uh, from what I understand, one of the coldest winters yes, uh, uh, Europe had ever experienced. Uh, yeah. What was what were conditions like for you? Did you have the proper clothing? Um, were you able to get enough sleep? Were you able to get supplies and such? What was, what were... Uh, well, we were only, we were living in a pup tent, believe it or not, a couple of pup tents. And you take, you had sleeping bags, good sleeping bags. You have to take your weapons and put them in the sleeping bags, keep them from freezing up and so forth. But uh, uh, we hadn't been up there so terribly long. Two or three days before this happened. And we had little Bunsen burners and that stuff. But, uh, later on, after I returned to the unit, uh, I was signed as an air observer to direct artillery from a, a little Piper Cub plane type oh, wow. of things. The artillery had these. And, uh, Speaking of fires, reminded me of it. When you were up there flying around the lines, you'd see smoke all over on our side, smoke up. You didn't see anything on there. Those, their troops were very well disciplined. They didn't dare. And of course, it was self preservation for them, too, because where we saw smoke on their side and so forth. That'd be a good artillery target. Right, right. But uh, while I was there, now my wife always said I not only had a guardian angel, I must have had two. Because while I was there, when uh, one of the first things that happened to me there, we took off in a plane to go fly around and observe. And we just got up, not very high, and we crashed. Really? <laughs> we weren't up very high, but the uh, wings iced up. And we crashed. The only thing, fortunately, I had a helmet on and the radio PRC 9, no, PRC 6, I think it was was mounted behind me here, and it broke loose and hit me in the head, but fortunately I had that, <laughs> uh. I had that helmet, so neither I or the pilot got hurt, and there wasn't any fire or anything. And then another time while I was there, that's sort of funny, uh, well, we got the word that the Germans had captured one of the liaison planes and was in uh, the area. So Major Lala, who was head of the uh, uh, air, what do you call it, air detachment or whatever, but they were strictly army, decided he and I would go up and shoot this plane down. <laughs> So I had a submachine gun and we went up there. Fortunately, we didn't find it. If we had, I'd have probably shot the propeller off or something. <laughs> so, Did you ever take uh, fire from the other side when you were up observing at all? No. No, no never did. Uh, of course, we 
flew pretty much over our lines. Mm. We didn't get too much into German territory when we were observing. He's, that was a pretty good OP though. You could see a lot of things and direct a lot of artillery fire. But after that then uh, I was only there about a couple of weeks or maybe less. Went to back to the unit, was executive officer of guns for a while. And going back a little bit, before the bulge, when we were in Holland, uh, should have known better, but we a couple of young fellas came through our battery position and they were dressed in civilian clothes, of course, and everything. They got away with it. But that night, we got 120 artillery rounds in our position. I don't, uh, and I, I still feel that those guys were the ones that did it. They reported our position, you know. Do you think they were local civilians working with the Germans, or do you think they were Germans that I dressed think they in... I uh, Germans. Uh, and I think that was their mission. What's it, what's it like to experience an artillery burst like that, being, in, being the target of that? Uh... Well, uh, fortunately at the time, the World Series was on. I think it was the Dodgers, I think it was the Dodgers and the Yanks, but it was a long time ago. And it was being piped over the telephone to the CP. So I was out of my foxhole, up at the CP. It was a big tent, a bigger tent. And uh, listening to the ball game, when I, have, I and Lieutenant Reed, Willie Reed, was there, and there were rounds were falling all around, and trees were falling. And we'd get a broad, and I say, "You all right, Willie? Yeah, you all right, Willie? Yeah." Then we decided to go down to the guns from the command post, and we managed to get down there. But still, there's a, a lot of trees falling and so forth. So we just thought, well, we're not doing anything here. Let's see if we can do something down at the guns. And as soon after that, the barrage stopped. But every one of our vehicles was hit. They weren't put out of action, but every one of them had scars from the barrage. Mm. And fortunately, we only had one fatality. But we were pretty well dug in, so forth there. And when I went to my foxhole, I had an officer short coat and a pair of jump boots and stuff in there. They were all almost shredded from shrapnel. Oh, so geez. thank heaven, see, I was in the right place at huh. the right time. If I'd have been in my another, foxhole. Another guard, guardian angel, huh? Yeah. Huh. So it's, it's funny how things happen. But then after that, the 82nd uh, fought through Smith and the Hurtgen Forest, crossed the Siegfried Line and so forth. And we had, uh, there in Cologne, had sort of an interesting little episode, some of the things that happened, is uh, I was, uh, again, forward observer, observing artillery, and we had to cross the Rhine there at Cologne, and the objective was to get some German prisoners. So all they wanted to do was get some German prisoners. So I laid down a barrage, not I, but I mm -hmm. ordered right. a barrage, yeah. down there on the, where we were going to land. And then when we took off, I lifted the barrage, 
and the infantry ran in and got, uh, I think we got eight prisoners. But they, it, it just uh, was very short and we hit the boat and headed back and I put the barrage back down and we came back across. That was a neat little operation. Then after that, uh, Let's see what happened next. All this ordinary stuff until, and then we were assigned to help the British Second Army. We was attached to the British Second Army, and we crossed the, the Rhine. There was the Rhine of the Alhada River up in the northern part of Germany with them and got within about 60 miles of Berlin and met the Russians. Is that right? Yeah. What was that like? That was a different experience too, because uh, you weren't sure whether you could trust them right. or not even then. But they were in the trucks and they'd haul you up. They were all commercial trucks, not military trucks, you know. And they had piles of loot on all the stuff and so forth. And they'd pull you up in the truck and hand you a tin cup full of vodka. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but, uh, and some of them, you just wasn't sure whether they were going to shoot you or not, you know. Sometimes acted a little aggressive, but uh, but then later on, when we occupied Berlin after the war was over, we occupied Berlin, and uh, we had a prison camp there where they had political prisoners and other. And the Russians took it over, and we, uh, the Ru even the Russian officers, there seemed to be very few of them that could read or write, you know. It, it was, uh, but, the, and it looked like their uniforms were the only uniforms they had from the first of the war. But, uh, also, though, they had a lot of money. They got paid in American military NPCs. So, uh, I'm not sure whether I should mention this on tape. Uh, when we went into Berlin, we initially were supposed to go into Berlin, but the one of the armored divisions, I don't know whether it was a first or second, had went into Berlin and occupied it. So we didn't go in until they came out. Now as they were coming out, they were holding up alarm clocks and pointing to their wrists. We didn't know what in the world they wanted. But uh, we found out the Russians would pay Oh, two, three hundred, four hundred dollars for a wristwatch if they could take the back off and see how many jewels was in it. And so, huh. they, they, well, actually, the Germans uh, had a scarcity of watches. When we were captured, the first thing they did. They didn't search us for weapons, they'd search you. your wrist for a walk. Is that right? Uh. First thing they looked for uh. is to take your watch. But, uh, but we used to get together with the Russians there at the tea garden and, and people, the troops got smart. They sent home for lipstick and started making their own jewels. <laughs> Watch it. But 
uh, that lasted for a while. Then I rotated home from Berlin. I, the division, I didn't stay with, come back with the division. I rotated home on points. Okay. And uh, went to the University of Denver. I did graduate, but I went for a while. Then I got called back into the Army when Korea came along. And I was assigned to the uh, 7th Division. In the meantime, before that, I'd gone to the 329th Field Art, Parachute Field Art Battalion in the Fort Benning. And the day after I got called back to active duty, I was jumping from airplanes again. Hmm. And uh, because of my uh, uh, schooling, I say I didn't graduate, but I went from to DU to electrical engineering school for a while. I got into, uh, uh, I was uh, assigned, well, they said, the career management called me and said, you're qualified to become a radar officer for Q-10 radar. We'll send you to school to Fort Bliss where you learn all this stuff. So I went to there for nine months, and then I was assigned to the uh, 7th Division in Korea as a radar officer. I had a Q-10, had a Q-10 radar, and uh, uh, my section was all made up and so forth, ready for me. And they were all uh, just privates because they just not hadn't been in the army long and they were uh, had been to schooling and so forth and they were qualified in the radar and that kind of stuff so they we were supposed to join up with our q10 radar in san diego and go to korea with that uh, which we did but then in the General Taylor came up to my site one time, my radar site. And I think he must have had a stock and Sperry, whoever had the contract for Q-10 radar, Raytheon and Sperry, I think, because he turned to his aide. I was telling him that these people were in position of sergeants and so forth, and they're private. Turned to his aide and says, "See that these guys are promoted." He got my sergeant promoted to sergeant, and the others to huh. corporal, what they're supposed to be, and so forth. Far in advance, they'd only been in the army a short time. But uh, we uh, then had pretty good luck locating. North Korean borders, and I uh, came up with an idea that turned out to be pretty good on house of call. The North Koreans would come out of caves, and fire their mortars, and then duck back in the curry caves, you know. So uh, I talked to the S3, the battalion S3 at the fire direction center and so forth, and we came up with this plan. We had located where they were firing from, but they ducked back in the caves and you couldn't do anything about it. So we put, uh, I gave the information to the S3 and he did pass it on to the guns, to the firing battery, so they'd all have the, the settings on the guns to hit a certain target. And then we'd watch on the radar, 
and we saw when we saw mortar rounds being fired, we say fire, <laughs> and we silenced a lot of mortars that way. Hmm. And finally, we were able to get them. So your satellite installation was up on the front line then. Again, yeah. once again, you were on the front line. But then after Korea. I got into guided missiles, would you believe? I had a varied military career, to say the least. I got into guided missiles into the Corporal uh, Missile System, which was a ground-to-ground -ground system. And it was command guidance, and it was obsolete before we put it in the field. But we had to have something to answer the Russians' missiles. So they came up. You'd never guess who the prime contractor for the Corporal was. Firestone Rubber Company <laughs> was the prime contractor. But uh, the Corporal, uh, I was quite involved with the uh, Corporal program at the time. I was head of a technical professional inspection team at uh, Fort Bliss, we fired from White Sands and so forth. And then uh, I went TDY uh, two or three times to Europe when they had uh, with the team to check corporal battalions. We had I forget, I think it was three corporal battalions in Germany and one corporal battalion in Italy that we'd go over and, and check the training and their status and so forth. And then the British came to White Sands and we monitored their firings and helped them too. And the British set up a missile range in the Hebrides Islands and I later was a signed to the 7th Army headquarters in Germany. And I got involved in that missile program over there in the Hebrides Islands. Oh, we had one problem there. Uh, where the missiles were exploding right after takeoff. But they thought, well, maybe it's the cement platforms. They had cement platforms. Where it finds sands, we just fired from the sand. So they moved their launchers to the sand, still happening. They found out that there was a little modification that had to be done to the missiles to put some protective things on some fuel lines that hadn't been done. And those were breaking and that's what was happening. The fuel was hypergolic, it was red fuming nitrogen. No, red fuming nitric acid and uh, aniline, which is uh, when they get together, they explode. Mm. Of course, that was how they. So after that, then I came home and was assigned to a Nike battalion in um, Macon Air Force Base in Georgia. And then my next assignment was even more odder. I was assigned to 8th Army Support Group in Korea that supported uh, the Military Armistice Commission and so forth. So we were at Panmunjom, just a little ways from there. We met with the North Koreans and that was exciting huh. thing too. One exciting episode that happened there is we had a, a Mr. Lee, a North Korean, who wanted to defect. He said he wanted to come. So at one of the meetings, General Chickalella was the NATO representative there for the meeting, and he slipped a note to Lee to get in the sedan out there. And uh, he was supposed to get in the general sedan, 
but he got in the wrong sedan. He got in Colonel Wilson's uh, sedan. And the North Koreans were aware of it then. They, they were trying to get him out of the sedan. And uh, our security officer then was Captain Tom Bear. He's a big guy, pretty big. He was a former linebacker on the uh, 49ers in California. So, so he took off after this one North Korean was opening the door of the sedan and trying to get Lee out of there. Tom hit him and knocked him away. And so uh, took off in the sedan and went down the gate, the North Koreans had lowered the gate. They had a gate and we had a gate, but they had control of, uh, well, it was only one road. How did that work? But anyway, they had lowered the gate and the driver just crashed through it. Huh. And fortunately, it didn't hurt anything, busted the windshield, I think that's all. And we got Lee back to our headquarters, which was about five miles from got him evacuated back to uh, Saigon. But it turned out later Lee was just a North Korean agent and he later was picked up in China or somewhere. He went, but they planned it. I'll they be told there. us. Huh. <laughs> So that was it exciting. And then after that, I retired. I requested retirement from the one I was in Korean. Came back to Fort Lewis, retired. And how many and years? Then, were you, how many years were you in the military? Pardon? How many years did you serve? Oh. Uh, <laughs> A little over 20. Okay. Uh -huh. And then the, I went to work for Red Cross as a Red Cross field director and service to military. And guess what where my first assignment was? Vietnam. Is that right? Yeah, I was with the 1st Air Cav in Vietnam as a field director. Red Cross field director. But that was the end of my direct association with the military. And then I retired from Red Cross. So. And that's, that's about the story. And did you have a career after the Red Cross, or did you just fully retire from that? And, and I retired from the Red Cross, too, as a Red Cross field director. I transferred from service to military uh, to service to veterans. We assisted veterans in getting their benefits and so okay. forth. Yeah. Originally, I was signed and took training in that in Detroit at the VA office. Then I was uh, had my own office at Muskogee, Oklahoma at the F VA office there. And that's where I was when I retired. Okay. And actually, uh, I could have changed to a different branch, but they eliminated the service to veterans offices. The Red Cross eliminated that and they no longer have it at all. That, that. So that was one other reason I retired. Mm -hmm. I was ready to retire anyway. Sure, sure. I was 62, I think, at that time. Mm -hmm. When I retired from the Army, I was only 43. So. Most uh, going way back to the uh, 456 and the 82nd Airborne, 
General Truman was pushing to get the troops to vote. And Gavin says, my troops aren't old enough to vote. Oh, that's <laughs> amazing. Was very young. I was uh, one of the older men, and I was 22, 23, something like that. But uh, most of them were young, hmm. you know. Well, while we're back there, let's, uh, I had some questions for you. Um, Talk a little bit about uh, communications with your wife back and forth during that time. Uh, was were you able to communicate uh, v v mail and such back and forth, or how was? Uh, and there was probably a, a very big gap from when you last saw her to when you saw her again. I would imagine, yeah. Yes, it was. My uh, um, we wanted to have children and. Uh, I left my wife pregnant. I didn't get the word that my son was born till after he was a month old or Is so. that right? But our communication was by, at that time, it was by surface mail, V-mail, we mm -hmm. called them little V-mail. That was our communications. Was that... Uh, but we did communicate that way, of course, but that's a little behind time to be slow. Yeah, yeah. Getting the letters back and forth. But we, we did keep in touch. Did, did she ever talk about, or, or even your, your parents talk about what they were thinking while you were overseas? They probably worried about you, particularly with, with the gaps between letters, yeah. not knowing where you were or how you were doing, did uh... Well, I think they understood that, you know, but there wasn't much you could do about it. You just had to live with it, you know. And the civilian population were into the war pretty much too, you know, they were really with it. But they didn't get news of what was happening as like we do now. Yeah, right, right, you know, right, right. Do you remember where you were when you heard that uh, Germany had finally surrendered and what you were thinking? That you, uh, hey, finally. Uh, yes, we were with the British that time. When the, or had we gone back? I think we'd gone back to an area in Germany there uh, when we got the word and uh, we had a sergeant in the battalion that was a former jockey and uh, I've got some pictures I have to show you of our horses. <laughs> he rounded up some horse and he knew a racehorse when he saw it. He said he could tell by their fetlocks or cut or something. I don't know exactly. Yeah. But he had he got this horse we called Nicky, and it, he brought that horse, brought the spirit back to that horse. It was just the poor horse had harness marks on it and so forth. They'd been used as a plow horse. It's, he brought that horse back, so she was a beautiful horse. Her coat glistened and everything, you know. As it was Sergeant Melissa. Uh. I had a little horse I called Peanuts. <laughs> but that's uh, And then we went to. I can't remember these things where we were. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. And so far. Yeah. But uh, hello, Mike. Mike. Do you uh, can you describe to us what uh, what you saw as you were traveling through Belgium and, and Germany, and as far as uh, what the cities look like and the countryside, as far as the war destruction, and and did you? interact with with the civilians at all and what was life like uh, we didn't uh, 
have too much contact with the Germans, but I was very impressed with the Germans uh, cleaning up after bombings and so forth. Their cities had been really racked with bombs. They were out there cleaning the streets and rebuilding right away. You know, they didn't hesitate. And when we occupied Berlin, I uh, lived in a house that had indirect lighting, which wasn't very common in the States at that time. One thing that was sort of unique, the garage was in the basement that went down mm -hmm. and under the house. And they had a turntable. You parked your car on the turntable and then you just turned it around on the turntable so you didn't have to back out. You were always going forward. Mm. That was pretty neat. But uh, I think even then the, the Germans were ahead of us in a lot of ways technically. Their German artillery piece, the German 88, is the best artillery piece, is still tops, I think. Had, had you, uh, over the years, have you ever had a chance to travel back to some of the places you had uh, been at during the war? And No, however, in 65, I mentioned being in 7th Army back in to, but uh, I never did go back to St. Mary Galice or Normandy or any of the beaches. Never went back to Nymeca and I'd like to see some of those places. But getting back to Holland a little bit, Nymeca, we captured the uh, bridge and secured the bridge. How we left, we turned it over to the British. The Germans sent two frogmen up the river and blew it the day after we left. Uh, uh, hmm. How about uh, through the years? Have you kept touch in touch with some of your old uh, buddies, or uh, had no, gone to reunions, or I, no? No, I sure haven't. Yeah, I know that Captain Alley has passed away and. I'm very fortunate. I'm 87. Uh, we're not youngsters anymore. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now, as now you saw yeah. the you saw the uh, honor flight shirts and so forth. I was going to show you ours, mm -hmm. but you, you saw them. Yeah. I'll. Uh, I'll. We'll, They're pretty neat. We'll videotape they all that. Great. Uh, that was a great. Yeah. I think I sure hope that all the veterans get to experience. Oh, that's wonderful. I really appreciated it. And I'm sure the others did too. The Guardians appreciated it. Yeah. They get, did a good job. Yeah. We got spoiled. Good, good. You deserved it. Well, as we uh, want start to wind down this uh, interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that... Uh, you wanted to talk about uh, you think if we didn't go over any parts of your story any well, and as well any last closing comments you would like to make before we we close the tape no I thank you for interviewing me and so forth I have Mike, I was gonna ask you Mike is there anything that he left out that you'd like well, to my mother used to say something about concentration camp and him Oh, yes, that's a good point. Uh, I have an 80-second book that has pictures in it, if you'd like to see it, of the concentration camp and so forth. That uh, we liberated more or less. Well, I guess it was just abandoned when we came to it. In Ludwig's Lust, Germany, there was a con concentration camp. And General Gavin, uh, they had mass graves of the bodies and so forth. And General Gavin made them 
exhumed all the bodies and put them in graves in the center of town. Oh, is that right? Uh -huh. But the, that's a pretty horrible sight. So you just can't imagine how people can live under those. They were nothing but skeletons, you know. Mm. It's just hard to believe. Mm. Now you're talking about the ones that were still alive were nothing but skeletons in the concentration camp, right? What, sir? I didn't hear you. I say you're talking about the people that were still alive in the concentration yes. camp. Yes. Yes, I'm talking about the people that were alive, still there. That must have been a hard, was it hard for you to, to, to see something like that? I mean, I, yeah. I can't imagine what that... Uh. Uh. I'll tell you something General Gavin said, but I don't want it on tape. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that <laughs> afterwards. But anything else you can pick up, Mike? Uh, no. Okay. Didn't hear any horror stories about his yeah. daughter's basketball teams or yeah, okay. softball teams. <laughs> so I think we're safe. Good. Okay. Well, uh, I want to thank you uh, for participating in this project. Uh, more importantly, though, I want to I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you for doing it, Brad. Now this picture was uh, the day after you, you escaped from the, the Germans? Yeah, that's Christmas Day of 1944. And I... Well, so are you interested in guns, Brad? Oh, mildly, I guess. Mm -hmm. I got... I brought back several guns, but I get them all the way. And then... Bill realized there was a, one thing he wanted to clarify, and that is in regards to uh, when he was captured by the Germans during the Battle of the Bulge. Bill, I'm going to let you go ahead and, and explain uh, this story. Oh, thank you, Brad. What uh, I wanted to clarify and input to the tape is what happened to Atkins. I forgot to uh, mention the fact that Atkins, who was shot in the wrist, was uh, later retaken by our forces and they found him in the basement of the house and uh, unfortunately his feet was frozen and he had to be evacuated. So uh, he never returned to the unit, but uh, at least we know that he was not put into a German POW compound or anything. So all of us that were captured came out of it okay. It uh, seems that Sergeant Burton and myself made out the best. To clarify then, there, were, there was four of you, right, uh, Bill? Yes. Uh, one, your, was it your Jeep driver that was shot in the leg? Yes. And he, he was left behind by the Germans, correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. And then he eventually was able to get himself into a Jeep and back to, to friendly forces? Right. And then the three of you were marched off with the Germans. That's correct. And... When uh, we planned our escape and decided to escape, uh, Atkins did not want to go with us. He says, uh, I'm staying here. I don't want to go with you. So just Sergeant Burton and I made the break okay. and escaped. And you'd said that uh, while you were marching that uh, uh, Atkins had been shot in the wrist and was injured, and you treated his wound. Can you tell? But yes, uh, I had asked the Germans to take care of the wound and so forth. They didn't 
do anything, but they did let me use my first aid kit and put a bandage on it and I also put the sulfur drugs, which was in the first aid kit on the wound. Did you ever have a chance, uh, well, you said uh, Atkins got, uh, you said that Atkins was actually eventually found in the basement. Can you tell that story? Uh, how was he found and returned to? Um, later in the following operation and so forth, we retook some of the uh, territory and they found Atkins in the basement. Now, I don't know the details of that. I don't know for sure whether it was our unit or another unit that found him, but I just uh, was told that he was found in the basement of the house. Unfortunately, his feet was frozen and he was evacuated, so he never returned to the unit. And Evelinger never returned to the unit either, so not sure what happened to it. I assume both of them was evacuated to the states. And you never, after the war, never got a chance to talk to either one of them, and I never did have any contact. Okay, know anything about them? Okay, all right. Well, uh, we hopefully got that clarified. Was there anything else you wanted to, to to talk about, or before we shut down? I think we covered everything. Thank you, Brad. Very good. It's a good tape. Thank you.